Right now, I'd uh, like to invite uh, Mr. Ashwin Sitel uh, from uh, South Africa uh, to share his screen. Uh, and uh, he's a, a renowned integrated water resource management specialist at CSR South Africa Council of Scientific Research Institute of South Africa. He's, uh, he actually brings in a 38 years uh, career ex experience uh, dealing with multi and uh, as a multidisciplinary specialist, uh, uh, leading multidisciplinary projects. And with that, I would uh, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Ashwin uh, to give a uh, talk. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chair, and greetings to everybody. Um, I think my presentation actually um, will flow through, I hope, quite nicely with the earlier presentations in the day, but it's also um, supplements the presentation made by my colleague, uh, Dr. Harrison Pinar, yesterday in relation to the CSIR. And I'm going to look at why we're talking about the circular economy in the water energy food nexus. And Prof. Majosi actually mentioned, as he said, the chemicals bit of it. I've included the ecosystem as well. And I think there is that extension when one looks at the nexus of the other variables and components within the nexus that could have a significant bearing on how we manage and optimize use of resources. So there's a slight amendment to the title of my presentation, Chair, it's decoupling South Africa's development from water demand through a circular economy and the water energy food nexus paradigm. <clears throat> Um, just in terms of the structure, I'll just give a bit of a context and perspective that uh, I bring to this uh, particular webinar. Um, let's look at the problem statement. And I think both my colleagues from South Africa, well, all of my colleagues in South Africa have probably articulated this pretty well. So I'll go through those um, fairly briefly. And then I think importantly, what has come up, particularly in this morning's presentation uh, from Prof. Majosi, the compulsion of the incentives from industry side in, in relation to the nexus in terms of efficiencies and uh, particularly in terms of resource use. I'll talk to one or two case study examples from my experience as well. Uh, just examine briefly the toolbox of options in terms of uh, resource optimization. Uh, and I'll talk to two of the CSR projects we have and just some brief conclusions, Chair. If you could just give me a reality check, I presume I have 30 minutes for presentation, Chair. All right, as per the program, I'll carry on. Yeah, so please, the context, go on. please go on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the context I bring is uh, very much that of a practitioner. So I've worked as a researcher, I've been in government, I've worked as a consultant in the private sector as well, and I'm back as a, I'm going to call it as a researcher slash uh, consultant at the CSIR. But very much the, the focus of, of uh, throughout my career has been on implementation. So it actually slots in quite nicely, as you'll see in my uh, next slide um, that I'll show you in a while. But importantly, as part of the implementation uh, focus is bridging that divide between science, the research policy environment, and the benefits to society. And I think that's key. And when we talk at the CSIR, when we uh, at universities now and the way things have changed over the last 30 or 40 years, it's essentially taking science, engineering, and technology into society. And I think that came out in that uh, book that uh, uh, Prof. Majosi mentioned uh, this morning as well, is what is the focus of society in relation to all of this? And I think very early on in my career in the water space, I learned that as a scientist, there was quite a bit I could do in terms of the technical or scientific or technological interventions, but it meant nothing unless there was buy-in from society. So based on that, there are two principles on which I work. And the first one is the 80-20 principle. And I think very critically here, we have a weakness, and I'm going to say I'm generalizing a lot here, Chair, and if the, the audience will forgive me, as scientists, engineers, uh, technocrats, we tend to be very accurate. We want precision, uh, et cetera. And quite often we neglect to act. So what happens is that we get caught up in what I call the analysis paralysis paradigm. And we wait until we have all the answers before we do something. I think the intention is we know we're going to make mistakes. We quite often will make mistakes in implementation. Let's accept that it's a reality and let's just act. But what we do in that case is that we look at what are the risks of the action and how do we now take calculated risks in mitigating those. So the 80-20 principle works here, that if we've done enough analysis up to 80% of the time and we can actually start to implement, yes, we will make mistakes, but let's get on with it, let's act and let's get it done. 
So that's the one principle. The second principle is also, in quite often in South Africa, we find we work in a resource constrained environment, resource in terms of the capability, the competence, individuals, resource constraints in terms of finance, equipment, etc. So what that means is that hard work will get us somewhere. But if we smart about how we work, what is the one action that we can do that can possibly give us 10 benefits from that one action? The one key that can open 10 locks is the approach that I prefer to use. And I think the other part of the smart action is that we also, again, academically, I would say as researchers, we tend to overcomplicate issues coming out from our analysis. The key is to keep it simple. And that other principle is, of course, to keep it simple. I'm not going to mention the fourth word there, but it's the keep it simple principle approach as well. And this has very good relevance here, particularly when we're looking or we're working in, a, in an environment of uncertainty and an environment of complexity. So one needs to be, we need to be very mindful of that. So I'm looking at very practical, implementable considerations when we look at the nexus and the relevance to our current circumstances. So hopefully that gives you some, some uh, insights into the perspective. I included a couple of slides this morning, just based on some of the discussions that came out through yesterday's session. And I think uh, one of the questions was the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. We are a business arm of government as the, um, as was indicated by yesterday's chair, as the largest science, science council on the continent. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna go into our mandate, Dr. Pinard did that quite nicely yesterday, but I think just to talk about our engagements with industry, with society and the various sectors. And I think the graphics at the bottom here, if I could just get me the laser pointer, that would help. Yeah, the graphics at the bottom here actually are quite useful there. So higher education institutions, universities, et cetera, quite often are engaged in fundamental research. Okay, a lot of them have moved into strategic or basic and applied research, technology development, et cetera. But I think that domain within the higher education institution side, as you can see on this little uh, uh, wedge I've got here, their primary focus is on fundamental research. The CSIR looks at impact. So we, while we do undertake some elements of fundamental research, a lot of it is strategic, basic and applied research, technology development. But importantly, as we move into industry and the public sector, it's the uptake of the technology transfer implementation. And of course, in terms of our relationship with the private sector industries, with public sector institutions, et cetera, because of the innovations that come through, the inventions that come through, each of these relationships is governed by our contractual obligations, the protection of IP, the commercial benefits, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go into details, but those modalities quite often uh, take into account of the protection of you know, invention rights and patents, et cetera. All right, so as I said, those are the intervention domains. And quite often we look at the science questions. What's new? What's changed? What are the impacts? How can we address these, mitigate the risks, and enhance benefits? That's part of our mandate. If one looks at specifically in terms of uh, today's, this morning's, or this afternoon, in your case, um, you know, focus, our industry-specific interventions, if I look at the national basis, I've been involved in the water sector since the, you know, the 80s. Um, but very early on in the 90s, when we changed our water legislation, there was a very strong focus that because South Africa is a water-scarce country, I mean, you've heard that we're the, one of the 30th driest countries in the world, water conservation and water demand management um, became a very big focus in terms of efficiencies in our water law to the extent that from the time in the 90s when the uh, legislation was promulgated, there were a number of sector-specific national strategies developed, mining sector and various facets of industry, uh, the agricultural sector as well. At the CSIR, one of the government departments has funded a, what we call a hosted program. It's called the National Cleaner Production Center. And their role is to enhance efficiencies, particularly the initial focus was on energy. They've now expanded into water. But how do they enhance and support particularly uh, particular industries in terms of their water and energy efficiencies? And there's some good work that's come out of what the NCPC does. Our Water Research Commission, uh, you've heard about it. Dr. Pinar spoke about that yesterday when Harrison spoke about the Water Research Commission. One of their projects is the, what they call NatServe documents. These are the national surveys of different industrial sectors. 
I've been involved in this in my days as a government official. I used to actually use the NAT service. These are benchmarking documents for particular industries in the country, and they're incredibly useful for, I'm going to say, regulatory authorities, um, even of, uh, uh, people that work in particular industries to look at how they are performing against national and international standards. So those national surveys, I'm sad to say that I don't see them used very much these days. Yesterday, John Zwimba was in part of the uh, um, attendees. I'm not sure if he's here today, but uh, that, that NATSERV series is a very useful benchmarking set of documents produced by the Water Research Commission. And last but not least, what I mentioned about the research development innovation complementarity. From the CSR side, quite often because of the costs of research development and innovation, particularly in the private sector, one of our modus operandi is to set up memorandum of understanding, memorandums of agreement with public and private sector institutions where we can basically support them with their RDI interventions, especially in terms of mitigating costs. All right, and then last but not least, as part of the strategic context in the uh, water sector, you've heard us talk about water security, the fact that we're one of the 30th driest countries. So water security, both from a quality and a quantity perspective, groundwater, surface water, the entire hydrological cycle is uh, an, uh, an area, a matter of very serious concern to us. Science is important sitting behind our, 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 our ambitions towards water security. How does the science affect policy? How does it inform policy? So the science has got to be independent and supportive. So is government and its role from the policy perspective, independent and supportive. We need to understand our current state of water resources and where do we need to go in terms of the future design state. I think what has been useful for me today, it kind of takes me back to my previous life in the research domain, is looking at a lot of the um, investigations, the uh, research that's been done uh, both in India and South Africa, and that informs the technical and non-technical uh, intervention measures at different geographical scales. So uh, I think you, you saw examples at wastewater treatment works. Uh, Prof. Majosi mentioned Sapi Cycle. I worked with them very closely in the 90s as part of the South Coast Marine Pipeline and their concern about um, minimizing the demand on water resources for production, but also uh, the, the pollution impacts. And at the South Coast Marine Pipeline Forum, there were a number of other industries involved there as well. He mentioned ESCOM, and ESCOM, as our largest energy utility in the country, has a very focused, what they call a grand challenge on zero liquid effluent demand. And I've done some work there, both on the water and energy side with one of my colleagues, looking at uh, with the growth of independent power producers with the um, uh, cleaner energy sources and the scaling down of coal-fired power stations, what does that mean from an operational and a process perspective? I'm not going to share the details there, but that's useful when I look at some of the process interventions undertaken by many of the colleagues uh, present today in, in relation to the investigations there. So I think... <clears throat> If one looks at these, there's various relationships, there's scales of operation and the alignment with the various um, uh, drivers, whether these are global sustainable development goals, uh, the uh, climate change protocols, etc. But importantly, from a water security perspective, water is both a supporter and a driver of our socioeconomic development. So what is that problem in South Africa? You've heard it already. But I think importantly, I think a lot of people forget that whether one looks at over entire human existence, our existence on the planet, water is the only natural resource needed for human socioeconomic well-being, but is essential for all life on our planet. It's always been that case. It's just that in current society, uh, there's greater demands, there's greater competition for a limited resource. The amount of water we have on this planet hasn't changed from the days dinosaurs roamed our planet as well. OK, it's that cycle that continues. So it is very much a renewable resource. Importantly, it cross cuts all economic sectors directly or indirectly. Um, like you've heard already, we have less than half the world average rainfall. So we're a water scarce country, approximately 460 millimeters uh, annual rainfall per annum. That's on average around the country. Uh, important to note, our development and settlements in South Africa were dictated by historical economic opportunities and events, apart from the political 
um, issues as well. But the, uh, the, the, the key thing is that most of our major um, cities, uh, metropolitan areas, are usually away from major water sources. So it's compelled us to actually move water from where it was plentiful to where these major settlements are, where the big demands are. Importantly, in sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa is very much part of that, we've always dealt with climate variability. I mean, if you're a hydrologist, you'll know we talk about nine-year drought and, I mean, just tongue-in-cheek, nine-year drought, uh, wet and dry cycles, where we have droughts and floods. But we compound that with projected climate changes. But we have learned how to deal with climate variability. The problem is climate change adds another dimension to our national water security. Uh, another thing is that 98% of our available water supply has all been taken up. And you, as you've seen already, by 2030, it's expected that our supply um, will be exceeded by 17% in terms of demand. The problem is left unchecked. This will constrain our future economic growth. So I'm not going to deal with details here, but importantly on this graphic here, you'll see the 15 billion cubic meters per annum is what we anticipate to have been reached very soon. And by 2030, this is the two points, additional 2.7 million uh, 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 cubic billion meters that we will require. You've seen the allocations already in Dr. Pinar's and uh, Professor Majorzi's uh, slides. I'm not going to go through those. But essentially, the message coming out of here, if one looks at the way we have disaggregated our hydrological units in the country, we have 19 what is called water management areas. This is the total demand. In various of these areas, our hydrological balance, available water versus requirements, quite often uh, is exceeded in particularly the key areas. We do have some spare capacity. I'm not going to go into that, but the options for augmentation become very important. And you've seen this uh, in the slide that uh, uh, Dr. Pinar presented yesterday as well. If one looks at the uh, disaggregation of the different industries across our, uh, our bigger metropolitan uh, councils in the country, a lot of our industries are concentrated in these areas. And these are the ones here. Interestingly enough, I see the breweries are quite uh, um, important one here. Of course, it's the beverage industry, not just beers, if anybody's having that thought. This is a very useful slide and an important one. And I thought I'd flag this again is that this must have been, this work was done around 2010, if I recall correctly, 2006, but it was benchmarked at the 2010, um, what we call unit cost of intervention. And we looked at, as I said, we move water in our country um, through various uh, big development infrastructure, impoundments, dams, uh, reservoirs, as you'd like to call them, and major canals. Uh, Prof. Majosi spoke about the Usutu uh, river system uh, supplying uh, one of the power stations up there. There's a major uh, 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 supply scheme that transfers water into the Usutu Basin to supply Eskom's uh, uh, water needs in that area. So interbasin transfers we've been pretty good at from around the 60s, 1960s last year. Desalinations come up now. But the unit cost, the average incremental cost of these interventions, as you can see, high capex costs, but also have very high OPEX operational costs and uh, capital uh, costs here. Yeah. Where it used to be hundreds of millions of rands or dollars in the past, they now move into billions of rands. And that's one of the limitations we have with this kind of mega infrastructure interventions for supply to address our supply needs. If one looks at this, and I think this is the essence of what we're talking about here, a lot of these are less infrastructure heavy interventions, whether we talk about water, less uh, water loss control through process or systems, water use efficiency, augmentation, reuse, recycling, you've heard all of those, and here's effluent reuse here. The unit costs of these interventions, they have many cases have lower capex, but uh, there's also a lower operational cost as well. But these may be the preferred interventions given the cost benefits that come through from those. So if one looks at this, what is the compulsion in South Africa? What is the compulsion, I'm going to say, in Southern Africa uh, that makes water use efficiency um, uh, important? So this is what sits behind the science, technology, and innovation. Um, yesterday, I think Prof. Raj spoke about a systems approach, and that's very, very key. I think we recognize this uh, well before our advent of democracy in the country. And the systems approach is both technical and non-technical. Non-technical, I'm talking about the social communication domain, when we had Cape Town's day zero, 
the non-technical interventions were about as important, probably more important in creating an awareness. I saw somebody in the chat yesterday spoke about education, et cetera. The awareness that's created in society about why there is a need to be efficient in the way you use water. Why is water use? Coupled with that, our governance frameworks. And this is where the science policy interface is important. I mentioned the issue of scale. So governance is just not at a government level. It can be at an individual industry level. The in-house policies, the dry cleaning, um, what did Prof call it, this is cleaning in place. I remember an intervention I was involved in with Nestle, and they found that they used a lot of water to wash down their floors. But rather than using water to wash down the floors, if they used a broom to sweep beforehand, it minimized the amount of dirt getting into the stormwater systems, but it also used less water as well. But just as an example, and I'll use that, well, not that particular one, but there are incentives as well. And when we talk incentives, there are both positive incentives and what I'll call negative incentives, the punitive measures that one can uh, put in place, trade effluent charges. And it, when it hurts industry's pocket a lot, that's where punitive measures, I'm gonna say punitive measures become an important one there, but it also ties into the more uh, positive aspect of finance and economic savings to a particular country, uh, to a particular company and the country as a whole. And that's where what sits behind all of this is the science, but also thereafter is where the science, engineering and innovation can follow in making those things a reality. So I'll talk to two kind of broad examples, but just some of the recent work I've been involved in, I published this in 2020, and this cuts across eight riparian uh, countries in a water basin. And here we're talking about a governance framework I prepared for the Zambezi Basin. And this was an important one because in our static region, the water energy food, I'll call it ecosystem nexus, is a very important paradigm that's being embraced very, very strongly and has been driven at a regional economic level. So there are frameworks that are in place. The problem we have is that the concept of the water energy food nexus sits very much as a theoretical uh, intellectual concept. And there's very little tangible benefit down on the ground. So part of what I did in developing that framework was to look at how do we break through that barrier? We have good policies, we have good science. And here I'm not just talking about first order science, I'm talking about second order science and even horizon scanning and foresighting that become important in addressing what I mentioned earlier on about uncertainty and complexity. We've got the administration, politics, government coming in there in shaping policy. But we hit, a, we hit a, ball, a wall here that a lot of that good work up there doesn't percolate down to benefits at a community or society level. And that's what we need to break through. So I formulated this particular intervention. It's called a shared vision and an implementation, but it's essentially an impact vision. Nothing terribly novel. I merely put together a lot of things that we have been doing anyway in terms of understanding what is our dream in terms of uh, 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 visioning for the future, but how do we achieve that through a process called backcasting, using the socio-technical domains and the socio-political uh, domains to come together in achieving that. But importantly, it's to break down this barrier of current nexus understanding and benefits all the way down, down through to what I'll call grassroots individuals, communities. And you can see, this is where the critical mass of our people sit, but we quite often hit the ceiling here, all right? So that's one of the examples I've done. This will hark back, and this predates a lot of the current paradigms that we have now in uh, 2020, 2022. This is work I did in 1994, 1995. And this was a story I shared with a lot of young scientists at one of the uh, symposia where I was invited to give a, a keynote address. And uh, as I said, this, uh, my colleagues from South Africa will know the little town of Escort, but they had four big, four major industries there. Two were multinationals, not going to mention their names because they are multinationals, you'll know them, but they produce coffee, they produce powdered milk, um, uh, and a lot of food uh, substances. But this particular factory produced coffee and milk powder. And I used to often joke when we would drive on a national highway, I knew exactly when they were discharging to the wastewater treatment works because it was a slug discharge. One big wallop that would go there and basically cause bulking at the works. It would upset the biological process at that wastewater treatment works and that works 
would never com comply with any of the effluent discharge standards to the environment. Anyway, that's the long and short of it. But I was the official in charge of that area at that time. And I said, I'm tired of this non-compliance with the effluent discharge standards. And I exercised my power and authority and I threatened the mayor and all of his executive that I'm gonna lock them up. I'm gonna prosecute them and they'll all end up in, in court. But the mayor asked me, can you give us six months to fix this up. I reckon, okay. I also went to the industries and one of them, the principals are in Switzerland. I said, you, you have a very grand environmental and social uh, commitment ethic, but you don't do that here. What's going on? And this guy was a, a general manager from Thailand who'd moved in there. He says, please just give us some time and we'll fix it up. Anyway, I did leave them. They changed the trade affluent uh, tariff system. And like I said, it hurts the pockets. That's a financial incentive. But also I said, when I come and sample out here, my grab and composite samples, if the samples are showing up that you guys are not, I'm gonna prosecute all of them. The long and short of it, as I said, I didn't close down the town because the threat was when the industries came to the town, they told the mayor, you promised us a haven. You can't go back on that promise, they told the mayor. And that's true. They said, if we leave the town, the town will die because there was no industry. It's an agricultural town anyway. But these four major industries provide a lot of work. They agreed that the town would be cleaned up in six months, and they did. All right. Um, what essentially happened, this um, the big industry, they used to produce coffee. And a lot of the solid waste, the coffee fines used to go to the landfill site. And the airspace in the landfill site was running out. The water, as I said, used to go as a, as a bulk discharge to the wastewater treatment works. They put in a pretreatment facility under the car park. They had no space on their property. So they used to centrifuge and they'd get out more of the fines. So a lot of the high COD, low BOD coffee content was now um, kept in-house. But importantly, they started to use those coffee fines in their boilers, and they found there were substantial energy and water savings that they managed to recover through the CapEx and OPEX costs within two years. So that went off very well. The other one was a pulping or furniture making, uh, Prof. Majosi and I must talk about this um, industry as well. Same story, whenever they, they had a thermal physical process of compressing uh, the pulp to make masonite doors, the problem is a lot of that was high COD, um, low BOD uh, uh, effluent that was generated and then uh, irrigated onto, uh, onto, onto a farmland and that used to cause groundwater pollution. But they cleaned up that mess as well. Anyway, that was a long and short of it. And there were a range of interventions that, that happened there. As I said, paddy number one, effluent pretreated, effluent lines upgraded, clean and dirty waste streams separated, wastewater irrigation management overall, real-time monitoring, Conveyancing was introduced. Um, in, uh, uh, sorry to interfere. Uh, can you wind up in two to three minutes? That I shall try my best, but I will. Thanks, Chair. Paddy Thank number two, a pre treatment facility in place, and the take home messages from that story. As I said, we do have a toolbox of options. There are national uh, requirements, there are local, uh, regional requirements, and there are local requirements. At the industry level, there's a lot of the technologies you've, you've seen showcased in the other presentations. But South Africa is also signatory to a lot of international conventions that inform the way we intervene in terms of our toolbox. Sorry, just to mention this, um, as I indicated with those industries, there is both the, op uh, the option of the iron fist and the silken glove in the way you put in the incentives and the dis um, incentives. So the next few slides, Chair, I'm not gonna to talk to because I think the earlier presentation, the uh, presentation prior to mine, spoke about the circular economy, but what we've been looking at is here as well. How do you design out waste and pollution to reduce water use, wastewater generation, improve water use efficiency and better water use practices. So I'm not gonna talk about this, but in the irrigation sector, specifically our biggest water user, there is a very concerted attempt to optimize irrigation practices that's been going on to, uh, for, for, for a number of decades now already, but it's being now more formalized. Eskima mentioned the thermal desalination process through multi-effect distillation. We will not talk about that. That was a specific project. Okay. Importantly as well, how do we keep products and materials in use? So the circular economy goes beyond waste prevention and minimization, right? The sustainable use of resources. And last but not least, in terms of our circular economy interventions, is also to regenerate natural systems. We do have a working for water program where we tend to 
remove alien invasive vegetation that tends to be very thirsty plants, but we use those for furniture making, for, for charcoal, for burning, etc. So they are alternative use. And ecological infrastructure, which uh, Harrison Pinar spoke about yesterday, for water security is also a very, very key intervention there. Um, my last few slides, Chair, is the two projects I mentioned at the CSIR that are looking at the water energy food nexus as a programmatic project intervention, but with a specific focus on implementation and what is the, 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 the role of RDI, Research Development Innovation, um, um, to put together a Korean plan or a program in, in consultation and engagement with, with both our public and private sector initiatives. And recently, uh, towards the end of last year, we published a book. The second project is on the circular economy and the circular economy as a development opportunity. And that aligns to government's just transition as well. And we're looking at what does the circular economy mean to various sectors of the South African economy? Is resource scarcity a driver for us to transition? And what are the opportunities and constraints? So just some conclusions, Chair. It's importantly from our strategic interventions, how do we decouple industrial production from water demand? So I think some of the work you've seen showcased here from my colleagues in South Africa talk specifically to that at that industrial level. How we decrease waste, increase water use efficiency, increase on-site wastewater treatment reuse. But importantly here again, coming back to the social compact of strengthening the public-private sector partnerships. So I think in, in, in closing that water energy nexus paradigm and the circular economy are our no option solutions, as you saw from one of the graphs that was presented in the previous presentation. And wastewater is indeed our new gold. But as a forward focused intervention, it's how do we mainstream these two paradigms in South Africa? And that's key to build improved resilience and our potential to deal with future shocks. But my last word in all of this, and, and it's, as I said, it's drawn from my experience working in the sector over the last few decades. It's to think and to act. But quite often, it requires some of what I'll call the out of the box solutions. When I've worked with rural communities, and I remember sitting with an elder in one of our uh, tribal areas and then the old South Africa. And he told me, Ash, please, you know, a lot of the officials come out and talk to us about water conservation demand management. We don't have that luxury of wasting water. We have to walk down to a river to get our water. So the way we use it, we've got to be very prudent in the way that's done. So water conservation demand management, we don't think about it, we live it. So the knowledge, and I think the knowledge that comes through from various scientific disciplines and domains is important. Coupled with experience, it allows us to start to connect the dots of how the various facets in systems thinking come together. And when we really get into systems thinking, same set of dots can get us to creativity. With that, Chair, I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ashwin, uh, for the wonderful talk. And then uh, good to know about the various uh, cir uh, circular economy aspects uh, in the water being taken care of, uh, being uh, taken up by different parts of the world, especially both in India and uh, South Africa.